All right. You've heard the way that last show ended. <laughs> You're near right. Browner's here. Lawhead's here. Browner and Lawhead is here on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. We will not be doing any uh, Liver King <laughs> uh, uh, ball eating testimonial or trials or anything of that nature. This is a more joyous show where we stay away from frauds like the Liver King apology or no apology. Jason Lawhead, welcome to the Mightier 1090 ESPN. You are here, world-traveled comedian mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. and you have a special message. You have two special messages, one yeah. provided by video, and you may have something as well to, to wish someone. Yeah, today. you know, it's my dad's 85th birthday, and uh, the, the, the old ball coach, they call him back in uh, the Lorraine area. So, you know, the legendary high school coach that coached at our high school for almost 40 years, well, pretty much our high school for almost 40 years, and uh, in the Ohio Hall of Fame, and Still going strong, man. Two-time cancer survivor, heart attack survivor, and uh, seven kids survivor, married 60-some <laughs> years survivor, uh, Cleveland sports fan survivor. But at least he got to see Jim Brown and some of the old greats back in the day and Larry Doby and Bob Feller. But I uh, love my dad to death, love my parents to death. I've been very lucky to have them not just be my parents, but, but be in my life this long, so uh you know it, it, everything i'm talking about every reason i'm on the air today the reason i have so much sports in my life and influence and the passion and the love for it comes straight from that guy so happy birthday dad love you um talk to him a little bit this morning and uh always good to hear his voice and last year i was there uh half of I happened to be doing a corporate gig back home during his birthday so we got to go out to dinner but uh miss him can't wait to see him in april when i go back so happy birthday pop what are you getting him? What am I getting him? Uh, I get yeah. him. Are you the most successful child? Oh, God, no. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'm the youngest of seven. I'm kind of mistaken. I've already got, we've already have, we, there's already children retired. <laughs> That's how old my parents are. <laughs> I would say, um, yeah, I don't think, I mean, uh, everybody's got a really unique talent in themselves. My oldest brother's a very intelligent guy in the software field and you know has done a lot of different things in that in that regard and has worked his way up and a couple of them uh went into my parents uh <clears throat> footsteps both of my parents were educators my dad was a coach so there's a couple uh teachers in there i've got a sister who was a long time uh worked at the, in the sports intramural department at purdue university for a long time and she's retired so she's had a good I, I think I probably have the most unique profession and kind of none of them have ever gone on tour. I know you don't want to badmouth your, your brothers and sisters. Oh, I'll badmouth them. Believe me, there's some things I, if you want me to. We're not. We're just talking about career. You want me to get it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, so if you if you if your dad had everybody for dinner, all seven, the main seven, uh -huh. not the not the knockoffs, not right. the not the not other the in laws, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, 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 not the ones who came out of the originals. Uh -huh. The original seven, you're all at a table. Who does he look at and go, you done the best. Here's a watch. Uh, whoever's probably not asked him for the most money over his life. He's probably, I would say probably <laughs> my sister, Kathy, or my brother, Jim. One of those two are probably the two that probably haven't hit him up, you know, as young adults. Like, oh, dad, I'm in a bind. Oh, yeah. So um, probably them. But, you know, hey, I've gotten to take him to probably a lot cooler places than most everybody else like you know i got you know with my relationship with bill burr i took him to the masters last year we've been to you know uh, an ncaa final game a uh, final four final game uh we've been to did you do your other siblings call you and go really 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 oh you're, look at you you're cool <laughs> yeah I, they don't say that but there's some of those i'm sure that there's some of those i've gotten those <laughs> i've gotten those looks before but uh Oh, you took him yeah. to the mess. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. What well, are you trying to get more of the inheritance? Um, no, but uh, <laughs> no, we all have great different relationships with our parents. And that's the one thing about a big family. Every kind of kid's different. And uh, so we've all been very lucky. You know, my brothers and sisters, you know, I'm 50 and I'm the youngest. So all of us knock on wood have stayed, you know, healthy and out of trouble and out of major crises. And, um, you know, none of those things have 
kind of hit we've been very lucky as a family i mean i'll tell you when i know some of the other families and people that have lost you know parents at a young age or, or other siblings as time's gone on and especially in these last few years when you you know people from your hometown and you're you're just a, a degree of separation from them that have uh, had hard times and man I'll tell you, you know, that's been the biggest blessing. You know, that's been the biggest riches. So I appreciate every day, especially after my dad went through cancer, man. I appreciate every single day that he's here and we just hope he keeps going and they're healthy. They're 85. My mom is right behind him. She'll be 85 in a few months. So um, high school sweethearts. And yeah, man, we've been blessed. They've, uh, they've they've given us a great life and they've continued to go on and they're active and healthy and, you know, you don't have to worry, you worry about them, but you don't have to worry about them on the daily, which is great. So you, you uh, promised to share uh-huh. something. And you I came through. came through. You finally came through. So people who, we had this discussion about Jason giving away a table on the show a couple, maybe a week and a half ago. Yeah. And um, he another, told another, us he got a new table, but refused to show it. <laughs> and then he had another addition to the house and didn't even tell us about it till yesterday. So let's take a look. Give you gotta talk us through this. Here yeah. we go. Okay. Here's here's the new addition mm-hmm. in the Lawhead household. All right, bro. Here's the new kitchen. Nice you like that? Country style table, kitchen bench. You see that? Uh, looks out over the patio. Got a we already had those two chairs. We loved them, so we kept them. And we got the little two. Some, some really nice custom bar stool chairs. So then now, when I was in Reno, so I had put the table uh, together before. And then this mm-hmm. came while I was in Reno. So my lovely wife actually put the little side uh, little tape, this little thing, together and put the espresso machine. So I was jonesing because the espresso machine got delivered while I was in Reno. Then I went to Vegas. And I was watching her making salt and pepper thing, but we turned it into like cinnamon and nutmeg. So there's yeah, and a little, and little and salt and, and, and pepper shaker, shakers. cute thing she had. She's an antiquer. She likes antiques. So we the turned that into a beans cinnamon and nutmeg. The and beans. there's the whole bean there and there. And uh, oh, wow. Look at yeah. That. Double mm. espresso. There it is. You come over, I'll make you espresso martini. <laughs> nice, huh? Now I got to tell you right now. Don't threaten me with an espresso martini because I will I will definitely cash that ticket in. <laughs> that dude, that is a that is a completely not I did not expect that. It's cool. I was huh? expecting a longer, like Viking like table. Oh, that yeah. is way better. That Isn't is that way nice? better. Because you and you guys don't have any kids. Uh-uh. If you have people over, one side for them, one side for you. It fits. It's very quaint. You can yeah. look out. Dude, that's a that's a nice little table. Nice little man. table, awesome. right? And I put that all together yeah. by myself without, you know, swearing or punching holes in the wall. So I was really <laughs> proud of myself. And the nice thing is you saw the table was was out like vertically that way. Well, if we want more room, like you said, if we had some people over, we can turn it you right. know long ways, put it up against the window, have more floor space if we want, pull the stools out and have some people sit around and have you know whatever. So yeah, we don't have a huge place. We don't have a, our kitchen's a decent sized kitchen for our apartment. But it was, uh, as my wife said, we utilize the space and everything perfectly. So oh, I, I go to bed at night already thinking about the espresso I'm gonna have. The fries. It's so good. I'm telling you, the oh, it's there. It is, and it comes with the little, the little, you know, four of these little cups. And yeah, she knocked it out of the park buying that thing. I don't know where she got the espresso machine. Um, we got the. Uh, furniture off of wayfair i think so yeah a lot of exciting it's exciting it's exciting stuff here in the lawhead household also something exciting Mm -hmm. happening in southern california padre fans it sounds like your owner is ready to spin and i mean spin spin so apparently according to reports and this is when i say according to reports this is he said she said okay the Padres offered Trey Turner, who signed with Philadelphia, more money, but he chose to go to Philadelphia for less money. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been around enough athletes to know they don't turn down mega gobs of money, period. They just don't do it. So the idea that the Padres gave out such a much larger contract than the Phillies, I don't believe that. I don't believe that the Padres are out here. I think they wanted Trey Turner. 
but they wanted Trey Turner under the understanding of this is the window in which we're operating. And I think he wasn't comfortable with that. And that's why he chose to go to Philadelphia on an 11 year yeah. deal. 11 I gotta, years. I got to believe that's where the difference was. Even if the Padres offered him more money, it had to be right. the length of the deal that the Padres were not. Because we're, we're, what, how old is he on the end of this deal? 40? 30? 40. 40 at the end of this deal. You know, I, I mean, the Padres are, I, 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 it's obvious they're committed to spending some money, but are they going to spend it long term on a guy that's getting into that age bracket that long? I just, you know, uh, I think it's probably a, a you know, that's probably the crux of it right there, right? Like Turner was like 11 years. I'll take less a year for 11. I mean, how do you turn that down to a team that was just, you know, a, a nibble away from a World Series championship? Uh, so, and it gets him away from the Dodgers. It gets him out of the Western division. It makes him feel like, Hey, you know, Phillies have already kind of, you know, cemented themselves in that AL East, which is still your NL East, which is still tough. Very which is still tough. And yeah, obviously the Mets get Verlander makes them better. Um, you know, the Braves, Braves won't be any worse. Braves are always going to be good. They've proved that for the last 30 years. So it's got to be the length of the years, and I, I think the Padres are are probably ready to make splashes, but how long are their commitments to those splashes here? This is a window, Correct. right? So, um, but it's good to get them out there and get them get them fishing, get people you know in those meetings, and they you know obviously the agents out there know now. Um, Padres got money; they're willing to spend it. You know, we may have to go to the table a little bit and play tug of war over years, but. Uh, ears are open and doors are open. We'll sit down and, and the Padres are for real, at least in negotiations right now with what else is out there and, you know, next year. So uh, that's, that's good for, you know, Seidler, AJ Preller, you know, Melvin, all these guys, that's good for them for what they have in stock already to be having that reputation out there to say, we're ready to spend. We're ready to make ourselves better. We're already good. You saw what we did. Come here and, you know, and it, it also makes it kind of feel like, you know, how, how how invested are they in Tatis in the long haul with with kind of at least fishing for Turner in this kind of a contract? So that's interesting as well. Yeah, I, I don't you sound like a lot of other people when you say that See, cause to me. I don't I'm not in that school. I'm not in that category. I don't necessarily look at this as a way for them trying to get a teeth get to tease his attention or necessarily show their hand as if they're trying to move off of him. I don't see this as that because I don't believe that the offer to Trey Turner was something that they thought he would accept. Now, if he comes back to you and says, because I, I think their offer is probably in the window of five to seven years with mm -hmm. a ton of money because I believe they know that they're operating in a window and that wind portion of that, a portion of that window involves Soto it involves Manny Machado. It involves Tatis. And if you can add somebody like Trey Turner to that, if you can add somebody like Xander Bogart to that, now this, within this five to seven year window, this is where we're going to compete. This is where we quote unquote make our stand. So I don't think any of this has to do with Tatis because I think you're you're getting versatile guys. Trey Turner has played at other positions. Sure. And Tatis Trey can. Turner, Xander Bogart has played at other positions. So this argument that this is an indictment on how they feel about Tatis, I just found I just find it to be very peculiar because these all these players are one a one supreme athletes. They can play left field, center field. They probably don't want to play first base, but a lot of them can play right field, can play second base, can play shortstop, can play third. But a lot of people also aren't factoring into the DH into this, right? So I, I think that they're making this move with Tatis at shortstop in mind. Because that's where he will be the well, that's where he has the most value to you. Right. Even if you're thinking of moving him at shortstop is where all the value of him is held at. And so if you bring in a Trey Turner, he can go to second base. You can put Cronenworth at first, and now you're still solid. But if you if you're looking at moving to Tease out of short, we've seen his attitude, not necessarily his production massively drop, but we've seen his attitude absolutely going to toilet once he's out off of short off of shortstop yeah and i'm not necessarily saying hey they're they're ready to move off i think that a big 
uh, factor is the fact that when you talk about value with Tatis value, he also has strong trade value probably too, right? For that contract, depending on what you can, what you can bring in, where the batting order, what the batting order looks like. If he's a piece that you had to move. My point was in this sense is that you named all those names. Tatis is kind of a, you know, they know what they they know what he can do. They they're not a hundred percent sure what he's going to do, you know. Right. And so, you know, the big the big issue I think if you're looking at it from a Padres front office standpoint, when we talk about this window, when we talk about having Machado, having Soto, um, you know, having Tatis, sure. But if it is a Bogarts, if it is a Turner, if it is somebody else you can bring in. The window is also you have to put that window against how long Darvish and Snell have left in that window, right? Because the guys in the lineup right. have have some years in that window and then some. Soto's young. Machado, relatively a young guy, looks like the kind of bat and the kind of player that can play, you know, pushing 40, you know, as you look at it right now. So the whole point is how do we get – the best collection of guys in the window where Darvish and Snell still have those probably three, four, maybe five years left of the kind of pitchers that can get you through in October at the top end of your rotation. And then what's around it. Cause you know, you've got Musgrove locked down. Um, you can always go find some arms, you know? Uh, so part of that might be in that thinking, you know, if we get this, what can we get for Tatis? Not necessarily we don't like Tatis. They're going to live with Tatis, obviously, if he's the guy. They can't make the move. They don't sign any bigger names. They're going to expect Tatis to fulfill that contract and be the guy that they signed. But in the back of their minds, no no offense to Tatis personally, this is a business. If we got a guy like Bogarts, if we got a guy like Turner – we got that kind of, and we spent that kind of money. What can we do with Tatis, and what can we get in return? So I think they're thinking they're that's in a, a huge spin cycle of thought around their pitching I'm, staff. I'm saying this. I'm saying this, and I've said this from the beginning. When all these reports came out about them wanting Trey Turner and then wanting Bogarts and 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 talk to all these shortstops, this is big boy baseball. When you have money to spend, and these are the players that are available at the top of the tree. These are the guys you talk to. Mm -hmm. They've all got the same agent in Scott Boris. And I think this is a way for Scott Boris to continue to get his keep his relationship solid with the Padres, which he has, and for his clients to drive up prices. I don't know what the offer was for Trey Turner yeah. without the Padres being involved. A lot of this has to do with, 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 with agents and teams and relationships because Scott Boris has such a grip on the top level players because he gets them paid. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. When you sign up with him the year before you're supposed to be free, all of a sudden you're rumored with all these teams for all this money and you get all this money from some, from some team. And so I think that a lot of that had to do with this. Like there's a lot of levels to what the Padres are doing right now. They're playing three level chess in the base in, in the, in the, in the off season, whether it be winter meetings, free agent signings, scouting, They've got their irons in a lot of fires. And, and for me, or a lot of irons in the fire. For me, that's big boy baseball. That's what this franchise deserves. That's what this fan base deserves. And I think the Padres ownership group got a whiff of what it's like to be good. And the cha-ching, the money came rolling in at a level that they went, wait a minute. Well, we were bad, we made money. Mm -hmm. We made money, but we made money. We're good. We're making money, money. So imagine now you get to Tease back. He discovers his form again. Soto discovers his form when he was with the Nationals. Now you got two. Now you have two headline national guys. I'm talking about guys with shoe deals, guys with commercials. You now have these guys playing for the San Diego Padres. That is money in the bank that you no other team has. And so I think this ability that they've discovered to spend comes from the aha moment of winning. And so I'm expecting them next year to be in the Otani sweepstakes. Yeah. Because they have the money to do that now. And if you keep putting competitive teams, deep run playoff teams out there, the money keeps coming in 
and a non-greedy owner who wants to win, which Siler appears to be, will make it happen. God, how great would it be if they landed Otani? A, a dual threat like that to add to that pitching staff in that lineup. That would be one of the biggest just pull off jobs for a you know marginal franchise for most of its existence like the Padres existence, yeah uh you know it, that would be huge especially if they go out this year and they replicate and can come close to or you know even go a little bit further than they did last year even if they don't bring home the title mm-hmm. to be in those sweepstakes would be so much fun and uh yeah and maybe this is just practice right maybe throwing all these kind of monies right. offers out there is practice right. a little spaghetti against the walls showing that you will if it sticks. showing that you're sure. willing to do so sure that and, and to and to me that's what they're doing they're showing that they're willing to pay. Oh, hey, Scott Boris, make sure you throw out there that we offer Trey Turner this much mm-hmm. money. And he turned us down to let people know our door is open. But our door is open because we got another segment. Mm-hmm. We come back. Brown and Lawhead, we'll tell you who's going to win the national championship in football. Brown and Lawhead back for a second segment here on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. If you guys missed anything, you know you can always head over to the iTunes podcast store and YouTube to rehash, rehear, Or just play the segment for somebody else. As always, like, share, and subscribe to the Kaplan and Crew Great Friends Podcast Network. Because, you know, we're the number one show in that thing. So you might as well give your boys some love. Here on the Mighty Air 1090 ESPN, I'm John Brown. As always, joined by comedian and world travel extraordinaire Jason Lawhead. We have been talking a lot about tables. Mm Because this show is different. And we also broke down whether or not the Padres are doing the right thing and trying to sign these guys for big numbers. We have a, I don't, I don't want to say a perfect setup for the national championship, but the teams have been decided. Georgia, Michigan, TCU, and Ohio State. I have argued all along. If TCU loses, they should have been out. Because I believe that this should be Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, and Alabama. And I know people are like, oh, Alabama, because they're the best team. That's why they've been in it every year, because they're the best team. And I know they got beat by Tennessee. I know they have two losses, but their two losses are to, to two really good teams. Two really, They're ranked in front of the teams that, they, that beat them. So clearly, they've done something to have had them in the conversation. But do you remember last year when everybody was like, Cincinnati doesn't belong, Cincinnati doesn't belong, mm-hmm. Cincinnati doesn't belong? Or I'll ask y'all a question. Do y'all even remember Cincinnati in the Final Four last year? <laughs> That's a good question. That's what TCU is about to do. This is what TCU is about to do. Now, fortunately, we won't have to have this argument for much longer because the playoffs are going to expand, which, you know, warms my heart. But this idea that TCU deserves to be in there, I think it's going to get cleared up unless Michigan lets everybody down. Well, I think TCU deserves to be in there. I mean, they were just a, a play or two away from winning the, the, the conference championship that they got to. They lost to a, a, a steady Kansas State team, an 8-3, and three, a 9-3 and three Kansas State team who, who, you know, the Big 12 was stronger than it's been. I think wins over Oklahoma State when, you know, they beat Texas more than uh, Alabama beat Texas by. They uh, obviously plowed through. That conference, Oklahoma State was eight eight in the country at the time they beat them in that old double overtime game. You know they beat uh, teams they've had to beat, and they got to the conference championship game. Alabama really didn't beat anybody, and and I know what you're saying is Alabama, the program itself. Look at Cincinnati last year. I understand that's not the, that conference isn't comparable to what the Big Twelve was this year. Um, I still think you know at the end of the day. Whether it's four or whether it goes to when and when it goes to 12, what college football has mm-hmm. really kind of shown, other than maybe just a couple of years since it's gone to the final four format, is really there's only been two worthy teams anyway. Whether it's been it's just been Clemson or Alabama one year, or or Clemson and Ohio or Alabama and Ohio State one year, or or Clemson and Whoever won year, like it really kind of has. And and yeah, they're gonna go to 12 teams, but probably nine or ten ain't gonna matter <laughs> every year. For, uh for me, this year, there's not been anyone better 
in the country at college football than Georgia. No doubt. It's not even close. It but, is not even close. But as you watch, as I watch this Michigan team, and three weeks ago, four weeks ago, because of the schedule, and Michigan didn't really play anybody except Penn State until they got to Ohio State, had no conference schedule, I would have said nobody's going to touch Georgia. Three weeks ago, I said nobody will touch Georgia. And even Ohio State at full, full uh, juice wouldn't touch Georgia the way Georgia was playing. But now the more I watch Michigan, I'm going to tell you, I think they have a real shot because they're so well coached. And here's what Michigan can do. And I, I watched I watch Big Ten football a lot during the season. Mm -hmm. um, Michigan can sustain 60 minutes of football even when they're not at their best. Ohio State can't say that. As as talented as Ohio State is, they are not – they do not sustain 60 minutes of football consistently. We And even games they've won over Maryland or whoever else in, in that conference that isn't very strong, that they, they were lucky that they had them on that week, they still don't sustain 60 minutes of football, and especially against good teams, where Michigan does. And what Michigan can also do is they're a second-half team. That offensive line beats you down, and by the second half, they've got you huffing and puffing and they can throw haymakers at you late. They've got the running game. McCarthy's played well enough, and he's got so much confidence right now that I really think Michigan has a shot in that final game, especially as you saw Georgia end the season. The seasons are long. These guys are college kids. No matter how, they, how good they are, they're 19, 20, 21 years old. And, you know, they, they, they didn't look great against Kentucky. They didn't look great against uh, – uh, Georgia Tech for three quarters in that you know, Georgia Tech was four and seven or five and seven or something like that in their in their final rivalry game, whereas Michigan really looked strong. Michigan looked like game 10, 11, and 12, 11, 12, and 13. Though that looked like like early season, we're we're in a hundred percent knocking teams around type of football. So I, I as much as I hate the Michigan Wolverines, as I hate to say it, I really believe. It's going to come down to Georgia and Michigan, and I really believe Michigan will have a shot. I still would take Georgia, no doubt, but don't count out Michigan. I don't think Georgia's going to run away with this like a lot of people think so. I have got to tell you, I could not disagree with you. Wow. More. Okay. I think Georgia – see, the the the, arg, the conference, the conversation of Michigan can sustain X, Y, Z, you are 1,000% correct. There, Michigan is as well coached. Jim Harbaugh has gotten mm -hmm. every ounce of juice out of that fruit. Georgia, on the other hand, can do all those same things, but they're doing it with NFL players. And I mean top 10, top 15 NFL players. The Michigan offensive line doesn't have enough pros on it to stop the Georgia defensive line. They're, Georgia has the best oh, I Georgia know. Probably had the best defense in the history of college football last year. And their best player didn't even go to the NFL. Yeah. So the and, and, and they had the number one pick in the draft. So the idea that cuz I think Georgia's only way that they're beatable cuz I don't believe that they are. The only way that they're beatable is this quarterback who people love, who to me that's the weak spot. That's Stetson. the weak link in the chain. It Stetson. is. That's the weak link in the chain. So if you're going to beat them, you've got to stop their run and mm -hmm. then find a way to make that kid beat you because I don't think he can. I think he can make a throw here and there. Then if you can compete with them by finding a way to score, whether it be through special teams or a blown coverage here and there, if you can get 21 points on them and then pressure them to throw for 21 points, more than 21, I think you can beat them. I think you can beat them, but the weak link is so hard to get to. And their weak link is so hard to expose. That's why it's so hard to beat them. Because okay. Alabama, if you remember, Alabama's weak link used to be the quarterback. But you could never get to that to part of the weak link because Derrick Henry would run for 200 right. yards. Menagee and you didn't Harris, need him. Yeah. Najee Harris, yeah. Mark oh, Ingram. Oh. Yeah, no doubt. Well, hey, look, no, there's no doubt Georgia's a favorite in this one. And, and you know, the one thing that Michigan has on their side is the way they're playing. And and, and let's not let's not let, let's not pretend that they're they're also Georgia's the best team, right? On paper. Yes. Michigan's the second best team on paper in the eye test, paper, as we've yes. seen it, right? Now that we've seen it, probably on paper, Ohio's probably on paper, Ohio State's the second best team. 
But on paper, Talent Michigan wise. has made themselves the second best team and coach. And, and at the end of the day, right now, out of those four teams, the two best coaches in that final four are obviously Kirby Smart and 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 Jim Harbaugh. There's yes. no doubt. I mean, and and that's what. So and then and, and I would give Harbaugh the edge if we're being honest. Oh, okay, yeah, and that's fine. That, but that that and that's fine. But he's kind of just found his. It feels like Harbaugh just kind of found his step maybe last yes. year or the or the end of the year before the last before that kind of getting all the guys he wanted. You know, getting them where they they went where the program he wanted it where it was where Smart already had that thing kind of rolling when Harbaugh kind of finally figured it out. So maybe Harbaugh's the better coach, but maybe Smart has just a little bit more. You know, he's a little bit more in the lounge chair of being comfortable because he's a great coach, too. And and Ohio State and TCU not taking anything away from Sonny Dykes. He's done a great job at TCU. But I don't think Ryan Day is in the class of those other two coaches that we just spoke of. I don't either. Um, and I think that's going to hurt Ohio State. Now, can Ohio State come out? Kind of – can they play with that? We got nothing to lose. We're the underdog. We're we're the four seed. We'll just roll it out there and throw it all over the place and make Georgia, you know. So Michigan may benefit from a great Ohio State performance that runs Georgia ragged. That's what Michigan, I think, has to hope for. I think Michigan has to hope that Ohio State gives Georgia everything they can handle and they can kind of take care of business with TCU. And when the other two teams lock horns the week after that, Maybe Michigan's a little fresher. Maybe Michigan's a little more confident about what they came off of as opposed to Georgia. Um, so, you know, I, that's where I think Michigan really has a wedge in there to give, you know, they've got a chance to knock them off more than I would have said two or three weeks ago um, by any stretch of the imagination. So it'll be interesting to see. I don't think there's going to be much uh, – surprises in the semifinals but i think that michigan georgia final game is going to be great i think it's going to be great i know you like georgia that's fine I but i think michigan has I, I think they've closed the gap in the last three weeks here to to you know make them a real viable uh, team that could knock these guys i mean the way they handled business in columbus uh throughout that 60 minutes um you know it doesn't mean that they're going to beat georgia but it means that right. they're on the, they're on their way to being the kind of team they're not scared of anybody they're not they're not they're not looking over the, the old Michigan like curses all the little things like how bad they've been since you know the early part of the century these kids don't care about that that's all water under the bridge True. they feel like they're the Michigans of the 90s with with Charles Woodson they feel like they they feel like none of that 20 years has even happened. They feel like the old Michigan again. And that's all that matters when those kids take the field. And Jim Harbaugh has them playing, you know, skyrocket confidence and execution football. And like I said, 60 minutes, even when they're not at their best, they just sustain so both sides of the ball and they wear you down. And then when the, and then when the end of the game comes, they, they can throw you haymakers, whether it's a big play on defense or a couple of big runs or McCarthy doing something that you didn't expect. And all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom, they've scored a couple of touchdowns. They've taken the ball away from you. It's going to be a tough task against Georgia, sure. But I think they're up for it. I think after you see what they do to Ohio State, we'll come back here. <laughs> okay. We'll have a, that, that conversation. The tone, I think the tone will be a little bit different. But – Speaking of tones changing, mm -hmm. the Lakers, the Lakers, Lakers have well, Anthony Davis more in particular have mm -hmm. people looking around going, "Uh, did we sell all that stock too soon?" Anthony Davis fifty five points against Washington, forty four points. Uh, I can't. I think it was Charlotte was the night before or the, well, the day uh, before. No, it was uh, Milwaukee, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, well, Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee, and Washington. A 40-point right. and then a 55-point game, and it really has the Lakers looking like they're trending in the right direction. I mean, they dropped that one game to Indiana, but apparently Indiana's got some players. Indiana's ball. Um, yeah, Indiana, Indiana's played some good ball on this road trip. They just beat Golden State last night. So there's a lot of moving parts as to where why the Lakers are where they're at, but it looks as if they're starting to right the ship, and Anthony Davis looks MVP form. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, they've won eight of their last ten. He's like you said, he's had games of 38, 37, 44, 55. 
Um, and they're, they've, you know, they've beat some decent teams here in the stretch where they've, they haven't been able to prove that they could do that for a long time or last year. So they're winning road games. They've got two, you know, off to the Schneid, two straight on this road trip, Cleveland tonight, uh, Toronto, uh, Wednesday, Friday in Philly. So, uh, all winnable games. I mean, you know, Cleveland's playing well, especially at home, but you know, Toronto's up and down depending on who who's in or who's out of their lineup. Um, and Philly's kind of struggling, right? Uh, uh, you know, even at home, you know, they've got to almost hope Embiid goes for these kind of games. Davis goes for the way they're playing right now. Um, so yeah, they can come off this road trip and with a big smile on their face with teams. So, and that, but that's what Davis had to do. We talked about this earlier, like in the, in the year where it was like, he's got to be that dog. And, and, you know, people were doubting that I was the first one to say, I just don't see that dog in him uh throughout the course of a game and can be a can he be the guy that can 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 carry the load looks like he's doing it can he do it throughout an 80 game 82 game season there's the question can he stay healthy can he stay engaged can he stay motivated or is this just a i'm ticked off the way they're writing about me and i'll go do this for three weeks because i'm good enough too and then i'll go back to being anthony davis that's the rub here because it's a long year see but anthony davis can't have the the question can't be can he do it for 82 games because it'll be irrelevant the question is can he do it for 100 right because the right. the lakers are looking at championships More. they're not looking yeah. at playoff burps the question is can a guy be great for a hundred games his physical uh record says no <laughs> yeah it, it, he might get you 40 but he ain't gonna get you a hundred right and so i uh, I hope that we see more of this. I hope that we see a healthy season from Anthony Davis because I think the NBA needs it. I think the Lakers need it. I think that at where we're at, you've got a lot of young guys stepping to the forefront, but you also have a lot of guys going down. Like mm-hmm. uh, last night was James Harden's first game back. He went four for 18 in and in an overtime loss. You've got uh, Ben Simmons going in and out of the lineup with the Nets, not because his mind, his brain, or his back. Just now is his knee, which he says happened because of the back. So you've got guys going, Kyrie deciding to play, not to play, or right. uh, retweeting ben, things. Ben, ben Simmons, uh, go, go, go. he's starting to play well, then all of a sudden he takes a bunch of games right. off. And so you you got a lot. Joel went down at one point. Again, LeBron and AD were down at one point. Uh, 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 the, Cavs seem, the, the Cavs seem to be getting themselves together. Giannis is, I think Giannis has been healthy throughout the season, but we know the, right. the trouble the Celtics have had with their front office and their head coach. So there's just a, there's a lot happening right now in the NBA with the moving parts. The Clippers, a lot of people's picked to win the NBA championship. Kawhi Leonard makes his return last night from, you know, fill in the blank injury that he's had right. to make the game winning shot last night. Paul George back as well. And so the NBA is, I, I'm an NBA fan, Me too. 100%. Me too. Before I'm anything, I'm an NBA fan. But I got to tell you, the way that these guys don't play really hurts the game. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've and i never been the type of person who wanted a lesser schedule. They should cut back in games. But the way these guys just don't play, it, it, it it's not good. It's, it's, not, it's literally not good because some of these games just aren't watchable. And then you got teams resting guys who aren't even good. Your team's not good. You need wins, not rest. And we were just not getting that. So, yeah, there's uh, just kind of there's a lot of middle of the road parity this year, which is good in yeah. a way. You know, it's going to help the Lakers a lot when you look at how many teams have double do- digit losses already in the Western Conference, and they're one of them. I mean, yeah, they're still floating around that 12 and 13 seed, but they're only a loss out of uh, one game in the loss column all the way up to six, where the Clippers are hanging out right now. So. Um, there's been a couple of nice surprises with Sacramento mm-hmm. playing really well, with New Orleans Portland. playing really well. Portland's kind of they, – they started out great. They've hit a little skip, but they're still hanging in there above 500. But then you've got some other teams, mm-hmm. Indiana playing really well, Cavs playing really well. Boston, I mean, when they get Robert Williams back, they're going to be a handful. I mean, 20-5 and five without him, uh, and that the way they defend out on the perimeter and as physical as they mm-hmm. are, and they, they just impose themselves uh, physically – at the perimeter with Smart and Brown and Tatum, that these guys play just so hard at both ends of the court. Um, they're obviously looking to me like the clear cut favorite right now, all things being healthy, as the best team in the NBA, playing the best ball, playing together. And with everything they went through in, like you said, the front office and the coaching department, um, very impressive. I think what the Celtics have done um, with everything that they've had to kind of 
uh, kind of walking on eggshells through this whole thing. But players play, you know, and that's what you got to hope Davis does, you know, will because LeBron is going to miss some games. You know, you've got to hope that LeBron just takes his little breaks and they're just they're just body breaks and get them back out for a four or five game stretch and you win important games and then let AD. But, but, you know, these guys can't, like you said, they can't take too many body breaks because they have too many losses to start out the season. Mm-hmm. So they've got to be a collective unit. And, uh, you know, Beverly, it, it isn't really helping them. I don't think he's going to help them even when he comes back, but they've, you know, they've, they've been able to interject a few guys, Lonnie Walker, Thomas Bryant, like they, they've got uh-huh. some guys that if AD is this AD from you know for the better part of the season they'll have something to say they got to get in there and get a decent seed though you know they got to get in they can't be in this play in round they've got to get in there and right. mix it up in a fourth or fifth seed so they've got to play well enough to launch themselves up there in that middle of the pack so they can look out and say okay who do we have to play round one? Where do we go? Who do we match up with? And let's try to win this. You know, first step is win a win a first round playoff game. I think when we're looking at the Western Conference, I think the Clippers without Kawhi, the Clippers without Paul George, have somewhere, somehow managed with a 14 and 11 record. I mean, their point differential isn't great. But at the end of the day, what's most important is where you stand. And right now they're sitting six with nobody really contributing anything other than the Tyloo's ability to coach and him getting the most out of guys like Norman Powell and Robert Covington. So I think and, and Zubots of all people. So I think that what I think the Clippers to me are still the team to beat because they're the most versatile and they've got the most set of proven guys, head coach included, going forward. But we'll have to wait and see, man, because the NBA this year. It it is it it's a race in the mud to start the season. We'll see who comes out clean in the end. But until then, we're going to catch you guys next Monday. I'm going to court tomorrow, so we won't be doing the show. But until then, see you guys next week. Hey. Brown and Lawhead, more fun, more time. See y'all. My year tonight, ESPN. Peace. Hey.